So we have with us today, Alan Savory, father of Sarah Savory. And you are a father and daughter pair who have championed for a long time. Uh, and might I say, sir, that you were weaned on uh, a holistic framework, holistic management framework. Um, and you're the next generation is in the next room, right? Your children, one child or two children? Two. You have two. Um, you have packaged in innumerable ways the wisdom and knowledge that you both have, that you've developed, that you continue to refine and work on in a field that I will over, um, overarchingly describe as holistic management, holistic framework. Right. What we're discussing at the moment I believe I can say, and I would invite every and any scientist in the world, including every Nobel laureate, to come into this discussion and tell me where I'm wrong, because nobody has for decades. Um, I believe right now we're discussing the most serious issue for humanity. The planet will go on, but we will bring about the premature disruption of cities, civilization. Um, we might survive as a species. We don't know. It is extremely serious. Now, for centuries, we've had acknowledgement that humans were causing what is called desertification that I talked about in a TED talk that went viral. We didn't have denial that humans were causing it for whatever reasons, not wisdom. I don't claim any wisdom. I'm a very simple person, all right? But as a young man, I became extremely determined to solve the problem of why I was seeing massive environmental degradation in wild areas of Africa that we were setting aside as future national parks. Mm. I dealt with some of the world's top ecologists, people like Sir Frank Fraser Darling. I was a 20 year old and nobody could explain what was going on or what I should do about it. As one of the first appointed young scientists in the game department. And I recognized over 60 years ago that we professional managers, trained scientists, did not know what to do. One thing led to another until by the 1960s, I had was able to discover what was causing desertification. And it was not the livestock we were blaming and had blamed for nearly 10,000 years. And that scientists and ecologists and environmentalists are still blaming. And in fact, the livestock that we were blaming were absolutely essential to the solution. And I developed a process, again, no great wisdom. I just cribbed 300 years of military experience in planning in immediate battlefield conditions to work out how to solve that problem with livestock. Can I ask a question yeah. um, to frame it for, again, an, an audience that has no concept of holistic management or the desertification? Why and how were, was that being blamed on the wild animals that were in these future game, uh, not game parks, these future national parks? It was logical because we could see it. I, I was trained that in university. I could see it as a young man. Explain. growing up in Africa, that that where there were cattle, there was overgrazing, the land was deteriorating, the dust was blowing. I grew up with it. I grew up trained to hate livestock because they were destroying the land and the wildlife I loved. And people, you can go back in ancient texts, I'm told, and find them blaming the nomads for causing the desert. And the top environmentalists in the world are still doing it. Mm. So everybody, this was logical. It was just common sense. So in the 1960s, I discovered that 
livestock were absolutely essential. Without them, we cannot reverse desertification and we cannot save civilization as we know it. Now that's a subject of a TED talk that people can go and look at. It's gone. At the same time as I was doing this, long ago, I had realized there was a connection between poor land, poor people, social breakdown, political upheaval, war, etc. So for an unfortunate 20 years of my life, from when I saw the first shots fired in anger till I was out of the army and so on, I fought in a guerrilla war, a civil war. Um, and I went into politics, which Sir Frank Fraser Darling predicted I would have to do if I was determined to solve these problems. And I had become president of a political party. So what I'm describing is when I became an independent scientist, I had to support myself and my family in any way I could. So I became a farmer, a game rancher, coined those words, developed what is a multi-billion dollar industry today. I was wrong. I, I got our national park services professionalized. Again, I was wrong. Almost everything I tried proved out to be wrong. But we just, I say we, because I, more and more people supported me and worked with me, including other scientists in institutions. We just kept working on the problem, trying to find a guaranteed solution. So by the 1960s, we'd got that with one part of the problem. And then I was forced into exile for four years. And I went to the Caribbean to live there and to work into the Americas because I couldn't go into Southern Africa because of my opposition to the racism of Rhodesia and South Africa. So I had a four year period where I could just concentrate on the science. And during that period, far-sighted people in the American government who had been observing the work I was doing. One university had been plagiarizing the work, mm -hmm. in fact, I found. They commissioned me to start training 2,000 people from World Bank, USAID, all the main American government agencies, etc. And the agreement was that I wanted to go back to my home, own country I would put these people through training in the holistic framework that I was developing, all right? And if they liked it and there was a big demand, the American government would take over the work and continue it and I could go home. Well, we put 2000 people through training, had enormous interest, et cetera, but almost extreme anger from authority figures and environmental uh, range scientists and so on, academics, with no scientific evidence, only proof by authority. I am professor so-and-so, I say it is wrong. That's mm -hmm. not science. That's, we had intense opposition like that and it, and it continues and the Guardian keeps quoting it and so on. In a few but, words, why was that opposition there? Yes, and Maybe. the biggest vested interest in the world far bigger than any financial vested interest. As I was warned by a far-sighted Rhodesian 60 years ago, is professional people's pride, egos, professional egos. Mm. And so there's, to this day, there's been no financial vested interest or corporation ever opposed my work to this day. It has had intense opposition from authority figures. It, it's human behavior. Yeah. It's every time there's been a new discovery that flew in the face of human beliefs, the treatment has been the same. So there are two reasons uh, for that. One, what we discovered was it's impossible, impossible to solve the problem of desertification and climate change with only two tools technology and fire. The world's scientists believe it is possible. We've discovered it is not possible because we've got all the money, all the labor, all the creativity in the world and you and I and anybody listening cannot even drink water or milk 
unless they go to the nearest river and drink with their hands or go to the nearest cow and suck without using technology. We are a tool using animal. And for one to two million years, we've had the tool of technology ever advancing from sticks and stones through the copper and the bronze and the iron age to what we're doing today using the marvels of technology. And that all became possible when we got the second tool, which was fire. And two, so for 99.9% of human existence, every bit of management of our environment has been technology or fire. And today, the global scient uh, climatologists, scientists are trying to solve the problem of climate change with technology and fire. The only other concept we ever developed or idea of a tool was the idea of resting the environment, rewilding, some people are calling it now, to let it recover. And that was discovered about 10,000 years ago. Conservation. Right. Yeah, so it's called conservation today. Conservation. Now that is an extremely powerful tool. It works wonders for biodiversity to recover. If you ignore the social consequences and the economic consequences, but for biodiversity to recover, it's the most powerful tool we have in the world, in the oceans, rivers, lakes, water, and environments of high perennial humidity. Parts of England, Europe, East and West coasts of America, etc. Over most of the world's land, it is destructive. It leads to desertification, bare ground, environmental degradation, because herbivores were such a part of the environment. We need to use livestock to mimic the animals of old. But what they're doing now is going back and reinventing the wheel and doing it with mob grazing, rotational grazing, grazing systems, which all cause desertification. So I just refer people back to the original work. All right, so we had discovered that by 84 and we could conclude what had gone wrong in management, all right, and how we could correct it. So now let me fast forward to now that we'd never had denial that we were causing desertification for all these decades, I worked on that problem, focused on that problem, helped by ever increasing number of independent scientists acting independently, helping me behind the scenes, right? Till we discovered what was causing it and how to remedy it, what was wrong in management. Now, come to climate change. 50 years ago, we weren't talking about desertification, biodiversity loss, climate change, these were buzzwords of today weren't there. All I was seeing was massive environmental degradation in future national parks. Mm -hmm. Now, come to today, finally, after years of denial, the majority of scientists now acknowledge that humans are causing climate change. For all my adult life, we've been blaming livestock, coal, and oil for desertification and climate change. Institutions are complex organizations incapable of common sense. Individuals are capable of common sense. Your common sense tells you that livestock, coal, and oil are resources. So with scientists now acknowledging that we are causing climate change, there is only one possible interpretation. And I hope somebody corrects me if I'm wrong. That is that management is causing climate change. It cannot be that coal, oil, gas, etc., are causing climate change when it's through management that you manage those resources. Got it. It is, all right. So. Now, finally, we have acknowledgement that we've got one single cause of climate change. Now we've got a capability of solving the problem. 
to draw an analogy, if you have your house on fire over there and you have a hose and it's spraying water, if you point it in the right direction, you're going to get on top of that. If you point it in the wrong direction, yeah. it's your management of the hose. Well, yes, correct. Yeah, and your common sense, you'll never solve a problem without addressing the root cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we, sciences have unknowingly acknowledged that management is causing climate change, but they're continuing to blame resources. Mm -hmm. Leave that aside for a moment. Thankfully, the management that we were able to discover by 1984 that was causing desertification is exactly the same management that is causing climate change. So now that we've got acknowledgement that management is the cause of, of climate change, we've got 60 years advanced work already done and had already 35 years ago discovered what it was in management that was wrong. What was in management that was causing such an incredible unintended consequence? Because no humans intend that, right? Now, leaving that just for a moment, what I, why I wanted to be in this discussion with you is when we say management, the public needs to acknowledge that there's two levels at which that happens. There's the personal, the human scale. You and I and everybody listening to us can choose to change the light bulbs, ride a bicycle to work. They can choose what they eat, etc. cetera, All right? The management that is causing climate change is not able to be solved at that level. The management that is causing climate change is the management at large scale. And at large scale, over the whole of the United States, the whole of Zimbabwe or Uruguay or England or anywhere else, the management is through government policies, political leadership, which dictates laws, regulations, subsidies, taxation, influences on research, etc. That's what dictates management. So what we have to correct is the management at the policy level of governments. And young people worldwide today are appealing to political leaders, world leaders, to take action. But there's not a politician in the world that knows what action to take. So that's where we're trying to be helpful to the political leaders of the world and to show that this very simple way forward, it is not difficult at all. Sarah is proving extremely capable of putting it into verse, into putting it simple way. Children can understand it quickly. It is only difficult if we allow our egos or what we know to block learning. Ignorance doesn't block learning. It's extremely easy. It's not a difficult problem. It's too so easy, perhaps. Yes, people are looking for a more complicated yeah. solution. Yeah. yeah, if it's not complicated, it can't possibly be right. right. <laughs> so let's move the ball over now, tap it over to the next generation. And so please, would you? Well, it's quite interesting following on from what we're saying. Um, so what I've tried to do is concentrate on, on teaching it to children. And that's been a big challenge for me to simplify. So what I did is I actually went into a school and started teaching it. Mm -hmm. And that taught me a lot because I thought I knew how to teach it. And then over the last couple of years, it's, it's really what the first time I did it took me a year to teach. The next time took me sort of four weeks. Mm -hmm. So just simplifying. But um, what my dad was saying just now, and someone asked me, the other day, um, I did a speech when I launched my latest children's book on it, um, educating children on it. And they said, after my speech, they said, is, is it that simple? And I said, yes. And he said, well, then why aren't people picking it up? And I said, because adults are blocked before understanding it. And, and he said, that's, that's what you, that's like, I want to quote that. So when I teach this to children, 
So this is the explanation I'll give. I go into a class and I'll very summarize it much shorter than I actually teach it. But I say to children, right, our management is causing most of our global issues, our decision-making process. And I say, we're a tool using animal. Before we had fire, we only had to make decisions for ourselves. We didn't have to make decisions for anything else and we existed in harmony with our environment and we couldn't damage it. And then humans, unlike the other tool using animals who still do the same thing, and I explain that we all use exactly the same decision-making process as any other tool using animal, humans develop fire. So I said, okay, before fire, we only had to make decisions, management decisions for ourselves. After fire, what did we do? And I talked to the kids and we discuss all the, the progression of tools and technology and stuff. And, and I say, well, what did that change? And they'll say, oh, we could build houses. We started planting food. We started domesticating plants and animals. And so I said, well, what was that? And they said, oh, we started managing nature. Mm. And I said, and, and then what did we do? And they said, mm, I don't know. I, oh, we started selling stuff. Like we'd sell our crops or our animals. So we had now, we were managing ourselves, so our social. And then we started managing nature, ecological. And we added a financial dimension. So what holistic management does, all this framework does, is guarantees and ensures that we now include those other two dimensions every time we make a decision. So before we didn't have to consider knock-on consequences because there weren't any. And now if we make a social decision, there's ecological and economic knock-on consequences and vice versa. So we separate those, we separate those. So it's, I always say it's like we push a domino when we make a decision. So we meet our short-term objective most of the time but we've pushed a domino and we've walked away and we'll feel those consequences later or we don't necessarily feel them. Someone else will feel them. And so that's all I say to the kids. And I say, look, there's a better way of making decisions. So we, we develop a holistic context and I go through that and I say, this is where we tie our physical and financial security to the health of our land. And I draw it all out with little stick figures. And I say before fire, after fire, and I show them how we make decisions and how it's changed now. And they say, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> and it's that simple with kids. Yeah. They don't have any professional ego to stand in the way of their understanding of their learning. They have total common sense. It makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. And how I've learned a lot through kids is to get them to draw it out. And I'll say, okay, draw that, what I've just explained to you. And then I go on. So I do that decision-making side, which takes a few weeks. It depends on the age of the kid. kids. I have 10 year olds getting it very quickly. And then we go through the ecological literacy. So what my dad was saying between the different environments on earth and how they develop differently to each other where rest works in the humid areas and, and more arid areas developed with herds of animals and we go through all of that and the kids love it and I teach them how the grasslands developed in the symbiotic relationship with animals and then they fully understand the tool of livestock and mm -hmm. the same decision making process where it's not a they and I say we can't have anything systematic it's got to be a process because we've got to be able to flow all the time with the unpredictable variables going on around us all the time. And what I'm doing right now is actually writing curriculum for schools with this. And, and again, it's all just, I'm just learning through kids and, and having helpful teachers back, back the work and, and some very generous um, uh, donations and stuff like that. And what I've found is when I'm teaching children, they go home and they talk to their parents and the parents are not blocked to it at all. Mm. When it's coming from their children, they're, they're very interested. So I have more and more parents coming to me asking and, and asking. So they're not, they don't have their professional ego hat on. They, they have this curiosity through their children, which is very interesting. What is this deceptively simple context of, or framework of holistic management? Well, I recently wrote a little um, article about 
um, how this all actually began when they were setting aside the areas for national parks. Um, and I called it the elephant in the room. And I just said, I'm gonna show you an example of a couple of reductionist decisions and the unintended consequences and then managing those consequences with another reductionist decision. Um, and it was, um, well, that's what the basis of the TED talk is also about is in the 19, was it the 60s, dad? Mm -hmm. That you set aside the, the areas oh, for national oh, 1950s, 1950s. 1950s. And what they did was those are going to be conservation areas. So their first decision was to take the people out of the national park. So the so the native the native people that lived along rivers and, and in those areas. And so they made that decision. They took the people out and that was a protected area for for the national park. And that's a perfect example. So they they'd met their short-term objective, they'd taken the people out. And because of the self-organizing complexity uh, um, that is going on, it's like they'd pushed that domino, made the decision and moved on. And what happened was the land that you, they started to notice the land degradation getting, getting worse and worse. And they blamed it on too many elephants. And then, so we make decisions to address problems or whatever. So the problem was now all these scientists, dad was part of it. And they said, right, there's too many elephants. They're causing damage. The same as we blame livestock for overgrazing, etc." So the decision of that government at that time was to cull 40,000 odd elephants over the next few years. And so again, they did that. They got rid of the elephants. Objective met, solved the problem of too many elephants and walked away to the next decision. It solved the problem. Yeah, and, and the complexity of it that they'd set this domino in motion again was, was that they blamed the elephants, so they called them, and the desertification got worse, not better. And it, so then if you go back to the first decision, of taking people out of the national parks, if you'd run that decision through a holistic context and through the social, economic, and ecological checks, you would have very quickly seen that that was going to be a, not a good decision in the long term. And the biggest part of that, not only the social upheaval, but the uh, human being as an adult elephant's main predator or only predator so they'd taken an apex predator out of the ecosystem so immediately you have thousands and thousands of elephants behaving unnaturally hanging around too long overgrazing, not moving correctly with the correct timing and then we blame the elephants not our management that caused the elephants to behave unnaturally was humans believe and thus all institutions believe there are thousands of ways of making decisions, hundreds of ways of managing. And there aren't. At the core, there's only one way, reductionist. And now we have to modify that and not have a, have a paradigm enhancing change, just shift our paradigm slightly to realize, oh my goodness, our management was reductionist. It is the cause of climate change what do we change in our management, very minor, that will bring about totally different results? That's, now I'm, I'm speaking very personally. I've only got a few years left. I'm 85 now and I, I might look good, but I'm running on spare parts and batteries. And uh, so with the best will in the world, I've got another five years if I'm lucky. I have an, a skill now after 60 years of developing this process with the help of hundreds of scientists, right? And I believe now we've only got two basic ways ahead of us. And there are thousands of people better than I am, more knowledgeable than I am, more capable than I am, pursuing the one route. And you are working with some of the best of those people. 
you are trying to educate the public to what is needed, a more regenerative agriculture, energy policies, etc., and try to enlighten the public in the hope that policy will eventually change. Now, I'm recognizing the research and the history. And when you've got two paradigm shifting ideas, as these are that are new, everything we know in science and history suggests this will take 200 years. It's already taken 60 years. It's uh, new discoveries of this nature have never ever been accepted in the life of the person discovering them, never. Okay, so I've got a few years left and what I want to do and Savory Institute and many, many people are concentrating on what I call incremental change, where you just try and educate the public, try and educate the public, try and get the information out until as a new generation comes in, policy eventually changes. And I'm taking the other approach and Sarah is helping me and Daniela and other people are helping. And we're saying, let's just get one country to change. Mm -hmm. Now, to try to change America or Britain or Germany or France is like trying to change the course of the uh, that, that... aircraft, an aircraft carrier with a paddle in your hand, all right? Um, so we've either got to take a case that is neutral, like national parks, and I've failed to get anybody to be interested in that, of getting us jointly around the world to just say, let's look at the national parks of Zimbabwe or Zambia or Botswana. So, so if we can't do that, the other thing is to get one nation. So we're trying to get Zimbabwe, where the president has already agreed to develop policy holistically. And we're talking to Uruguay and other countries. I spoke to the people of Ireland recently. Some people in Scotland, I believe, are interested. But it's going to take a small nation, doesn't matter whether it's dictatorship or democracy, doesn't matter, a small nation where it's reasonably mobile. And what I'm proposing to the president or the prime minister, the leader of that nation, is that they take no risk at all. Just develop agricultural policy. Let's take one policy, agriculture, develop it as they've always done, because that's what the public expects even though we know agriculture is the most destructive industry ever in the history of the world because of government policies today in the U European Union, America, all over, keep doing that. And simultaneously as concurrent action without any risk, just develop a small policy task force and let us facilitate that and how show that small group how to get the nation to develop an agricultural policy holistically in the interests of the whole nation, all its industries, its companies, its citizens, because nobody, nobody is deliberately trying to destroy civilization. There's not a single politician who knows what to do. The young people like Greta are demanding action, but what action? More of the same? So if we just have the world and the media observe and have one nation, small nation, take no risk and develop an agricultural policy holistically, everybody can see how simple it is relatively, how straightforward it is, how it takes everything to a statesman-like level above party politics or dictatorships or anything. Because in the end, without agriculture, you can't have any government, any university, any civilization. So that's what I'm trying to do. And if I can achieve that in the remaining time of my life, I, I will have finished my innings. Everybody is wanting a better life. Everybody is wanting more security, more prosperity, more stability. That takes a healthier environment and more integrity, etc. We're just starting to do what everybody wants.